when we think of the sow going into the farrowing house and enduring an event such as farrowing, which is very energy demanding, um, and she's going to be using, you know, all of her reproductive muscles, um, when she goes into that barn um, in a state like anemia, um, that's going to cause, you know, of course, um, some concern uh, biologically. And so she's got low hemoglobin levels. Um, that's uh, most likely going to impair uh, contractions is what we um, have gathered. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Caitlin McClellan, a PhD student at South Dakota State University. So Caitlin, before we begin, could you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Sure. So I'm originally from Southern California, and I did my bachelor's degree at Cal State University, Fresno. I came out here to South Dakota State University to pursue a master's degree in swine nutrition and just defended my master's this past May and have now started up my PhD work here uh, at South Dakota State. Uh, most of my work has uh, been centered around sows, um, particularly sow anemia, um, and kind of discovering the prevalence of anemia um, in the sow over her lifespan from the guilt phase um, across multiple reproductive cycles, um, as well as looking into potential implications of anemia in the sow. Gotcha. So I understand some of that research that you did at South Dakota State has revolved around using hemoglobin as a potential biomarker for identifying at-risk sows prior to farrowing. So could you explain how hemoglobin levels serve as a biomarker and what role they play in determining the farrowing duration and outcomes in sows? Sure. So when we think of anemia, um, it's, it's defined by low hemoglobin and red blood cells, right? And so anemia will cause uh, low oxygen carrying capacity. Um, so basically what that means is the animal has less capacity to carry oxygen uh, through the blood to areas of need, such as the tissues and those organs. And so when we think of the sow going into the farrowing house and enduring an event such as farrowing, which is very energy demanding, um, and she's going to be using, you know, all of her reproductive muscles. Um, when she goes into that barn um, in a state like anemia, um, that's going to cause, you know, of course, um, some concern uh, biologically. And so she's got low hemoglobin levels. Um, that's uh, most likely going to impair uh, contractions is what we um, have gathered. And so um, we've done a lot of work here uh, using hemoglobin to screen sows going into farrowing. And so we have found that those sows going into farrowing um, at a lower uh, hemoglobin level are going to be those sows that uh, may have more potential complications during that farrowing process. Gotcha. So what are some of the implications of prolonged farrowing on stillbirth rates and sow health? So of course, uh, prolonged farrowing rates has long ago been established to be correlated with uh, stillborn rates, right? And so if they're farrowing longer, they're going to um, you know, have less ability to get those pigs out in a timely manner. They're more likely to experience hypoxia. Um, and so we'll have an increase in stillborn rates um, with those prolonged farrowings. But when we focus in on the sow and what that might mean for her, um, when we think of um, farrowing, like I said, a very energy demanding process. And so she's, she's enduring a farrowing um, that is longer than what we would um, call normal. And so that might have different uh, meaning for, for everyone. There's really no universal uh, time for that, especially with our total born um, number being so high at this point. Uh, there is some work that's been done to, that has recommended a threshold of 300 minutes. And so um, that's about five hours. And so if she is going over that 300 minutes, a lot of work has found that she will have an increase in stillborn rate. Um, but what that means for her is, um, you know, if she's farrowing longer, she's going to have more incidents of sleeving. She's going to have more human intervention. Um, and things like that can lead to post-farrowing uh, fever and, um, you know, off-feed events during that lactation period. And what, you know, those things can lead to is an increase in fallout rate, you know, post-farrowing and maybe even into her subsequent uh, reproductive cycles. Gotcha. So what were some of those key findings that you found regarding the relationship between hemoglobin concentration and farrowing duration in sows? Yeah. So as I mentioned, we screened sows going into the farrowing house. And so we screened those sows for hemoglobin at day 112 of gestation. And so 
Um, hemoglobin is uh, tested via blood, of course, and it is expressed in grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of whole blood typically. And so we took those hemoglobin um, measures and kind of put them with that sow's piglet outcomes and also her farrowing duration. And so that was uh, that gave us the ability to kind of gather reference ranges for those sows and determine that if that sow entered farrowing into or entered farrowing with a hemoglobin of less than 10 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin, she was more likely to experience a prolonged farrowing duration and have that increase in stillborn rates. And so we determined that that below 10 um, kind of equal to sows that um, had farrowing durations of twofold greater than those sows that had 10 or higher uh, going into farrowing. Um, and on top of that, we also did track um, sow removal occurrence from the point of uh, that time when we took the hemoglobin in those sows all the way until her subsequent reproductive cycle um, ended. And so we found that we did have an increase in sow removals um, from those sows that had that uh, prolonged farrowing duration, um, which may or may not have been, you know, directly related to that hemoglobin, but those sows entering with low hemoglobin were more likely to have that prolonged farrowing. Gotcha. So how might your findings influence practical recommendations for swine producers and veterinarians in managing sow health and optimizing farrowing outcomes? So I think right now, just being aware of the prevalence of anemia in sow herds is quite important. Aside from work done here, there is some recent work that screened for hemoglobin in sows across 11 commercial sow farms, finding there to be approximately a 50% prevalence across those commercial herds uh, where they screened the hemoglobin in. And so now understanding that anemia in the sow could come with implications such as prolonged farrowing, stillborn incidents, and sow fallout. Uh, may prompt farms to want to become uh, proactive in regards to this issue. And so hemoglobin is, of course, a direct measure of anemia, and the method in which we used uh, to measure it um, in our research and on our farm was done using a handheld device called a hemoq. And that hemoq only requires a small drop of blood. And so typically to obtain that blood, it is done by pricking the ear vein. And so we're able to uh, collect a sow and get hemoglobin reading on that sow in about a minute. So the method is um, very efficient. It's also uh, very cost effective relative to lab testing. And so I do think having a hemoq on site uh, for testing is something that is feasible and testing those sows coming into the farrowing room could potentially allow for uh, that front line in the barn to flag those sows and allocate more of their time and attention to those anemic sows. And so based on what we have seen, those low hemoglobin sows are going to often be the ones who are going to need more assistance with pulling pigs. And those high hemoglobin sows, on the other hand, are often going to be those ones who are going to lay down and have their pigs quickly and often need minimal to no assistance. And then aside from blood hemoglobin, especially if testing is not feasible on a given farm, clinical symptoms can be very important as well. Uh, typically, the anemic sows are often going to be those ones who are really just more lethargic and sluggish appearing. Uh, they often act as if they lacked, lack energy. And so informing barn staff uh, what these clinical symptoms may look like could be very important for um, understanding which sows are going to be at risk for a prolonged farrowing event. Kim and calls all swine experts. You already know the key to a profitable swine operation is healthy, productive pigs. Our team of swine experts are driven by curiosity to create science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash swine. Gotcha. And in terms of future research, you said you just started your PhD and finished your master's. So in terms of addressing gaps in current knowledge or possibly exploring new avenues, what do you think are the, the next steps for this type of research? I guess just understanding uh, anemia in the sow and what may be causing it would be my next steps. Of course, there's a high chance it's caused by an iron deficiency. Um, and whether it is caused by an iron deficiency or not, um, I guess kind of pinpointing the um, the epidemiology of the issue right now. And so, um, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, just add more iron to the diet, but that becomes a little bit challenging. Um, currently, we do 
uh, include iron into the sow diet at two to three fold greater than what is uh, estimated or the requirements that are estimated in the NRC. Um, and I guess just adding more dietary iron to the diet becomes challenging because um, we don't know you know, what the sole issue is. And iron is one of those uh, complex minerals that can interact with other minerals. And so when you add one mineral to the diet, um, the chances that it's going to interact with the other minerals and um, potentially cause a different deficiency is there. Um, and also currently the iron that is in our sow diets um, is mostly coming from ferrous sulfate, right? And ferrous sulfate, adding more of it to the diet, um, there's chances of, you know, a lot of GI upset, um, Iron um, has the role to um, kind of cause those issues in, in sows. And so understanding what adding more iron to the diet could do. Um, currently, my uh, future research plans is to kind of look at different iron sources, maybe ones that aren't so harsh on the, the GI tract, um, and seeing if we can move hemoglobin levels in an upward direction um, by increasing iron absorption. Um, so that is something I am currently working on is kind of looking at more of the iron metabolism side and seeing if we could move the issue upwards. Awesome. Well, I believe that's all the time we have. So thank you, Caitlin, for coming on the show and best of luck in your future research with your PhD. Yep. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Uh, anytime. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com.